Hello, everyone. My name is Emily Schmidt, and I am a teaching artist based in the Washington, D.C. area. I'm really excited to be joined today by Michael Curry for this interview through the National Theatre Foundation's Teens Behind the Scenes program. So we have some students coming to see Beetlejuice in, in May, and Michael Curry designed the puppets for Beetlejuice originally. So that'll be part of what we talk about today, but also... Um, just kind of um, design in general. So I wanna just begin by thanking Michael for his time um, and we're really excited to get into it. Um, so before we get started, I'm just gonna, gonna give you a, a brief bio on some of Michael's work and then we'll hear from him. So for over 30 years, Michael Curry has been among the most prolific live entertainment creative directors. He's best known for his innovative character and puppetry designs across multiple theatrical forms. These include award-winning productions in theater, spectacle, opera, dance, film, ceremonies, and themed entertainment. Michael works closely with his long-term team in Portland, Oregon, where they develop innovative solutions for future projects, as well as support multiple ongoing theatrical productions throughout the world, including The Lion King and Frozen. Well, Michael, I know that just scratches the surface of, of everything that you do. Um, so I this, the first thing I wanted to ask is, could you go ahead and introduce yourself to the students and then maybe tell a little bit about your career journey? You have so many impressive projects under your belt. And so I'd love to hear more about how you got to yeah. be the designer you are today. Good. Thank you for the introduction. Um, and it's nice to meet all of you uh, uh, telegenically. Uh, it's it, it's uh, one of my favorite things to do is speak to people who haven't fully formed themselves, you know, students and uh, exposing some of the options. Uh, it's a misunderstood world, the arts in general, theater arts, you know, it's, uh, it's, it has an impression to people from the outside that is often unmasked and is quite different once you understand the inside of it. So this, the programs like this are really great for you getting, getting a chance to see, you know, behind the curtain and, and then probably many of you are interested in pure performance, but along the way of uh, in a journey of somebody doing live theater, live entertainment, uh, many options come for the different vocations and uh, that might present themselves. I'm a big fan of saying, well, early on, even though you might be a dancer, actor, singer, pay attention to the methods and materiality and the physics of theater. And it helps you along the way. It certainly helps you get what you want because you understand the process. And I will say many people make the choice at choice at some point in their career to become involved in the behind the scenes. And that there is, there are more positions and careers that are not performers than there are performers. So people are often surprised. Amateurs are surprised by, wow, I didn't know there that was that much behind the scenes. I didn't know there that was that much to it. Um, but just speaking for myself, I'm a, I'm known as a designer of characters and I am a character designer. I started as an artist who wanted to paint and sculpt the human figure. And so my background is entirely in fine arts, meaning I was a gallery artist in New York doing sculptures and paintings in my 20s. And I started making those sculptures move. I, um, I came from a family of inventors and engineers, and but I'm a pure artist. I really... Uh, I still am, but I am, I have a great engineering background and I did a series of sculptures where the sculptures moved. Angels had wings that moved. And this was in the eighties. And it, it, the review, I, I had a review of a show and they said how theatrical the work was and it belonged on stage. And I was sort of appalled. And I was, that was the first time puppetry was ever used to describe my work by a very prominent New York uh, gallery reviewer. And, but it was so interesting in the eighties films had started to hit the scene that had special effects, star Wars, most notably. Um, and shortly after because live entertainment follows cinema a great deal. Um, there was a, there was an ask on stage for technical effects. Broadway wasn't set up with the uh, craftspeople, milliners, costumers, 
props builders were still in the world of leather and plaster of Paris and kind of traditional techniques. I wouldn't say old fashioned because they still have a place in our world, but there wasn't. Uh, and even, even in Hollywood, the, the nascent uh, field of special effects and character design and, you know, prosthetics were in their early stages. So I was at the right place, wrong time kind of thing, because I started getting asked right from the gallery to do stage shows, cats, Starlight Express, things that required vacuum form plastic and high tech, you know, lighting on board costumes were being uh, creatives were asking for this because I think they were seeing it in film mm -hmm. and asking for. It. And so weirdly enough, my first few projects came from requests. Could you figure this out? And uh, there was a big Las Vegas show, the Siegfried and Roy show going on in the late 80s, and they wanted remarkable effects that had, hadn't, there was no industry to support it. So I took, I was very, I've just always been curious. And I would think that this is a quality that you should try to adopt. If you don't naturally, if you're not a curious person, there are techniques to help you along with that way. So I, I started taking these challenges. I loved it because my first shows, um, I didn't even hire theater people. I hired the sculptors and the artists and the technical, the welders I knew. And soon I found myself uh, having a real place on Broadway as being a problem solver for technical craft work. I was always, as I said, uh, a figurative sculptor and painter. So I am, I have, I am expert level drafting skills, painting skills and sculpting skills, but Here's what really blew my mind, how much I enjoyed the theater process. And the two things that most stood out is artists work alone. There's a tradition of dark, intellectual, alcoholic artists working alone. I was that. Uh, when I started getting involved in theater, suddenly there were six or eight collaborators around a table mm -hmm. and they had a script to work from, an actual vessel that sort of there were boundaries to the thinking. And I found myself so freed up by the idea of working from a story in arts. We often do these exploratory periods and we come to understand what we're doing only after being kind of thrashing around in the, in the muck for a while in theater, you often have a clarified story. And what's great is you have a lighting designer, a writer, a composer, a director, and all of these shared voices were really refreshing to me. And I found I was really good. And I found that what I was missing in my fine art career, then I was 25, successful, making a living. I was lonely. Mm -hmm. I was working in a void and theater. So I started really enjoying the participatory process. And then another thing that happened, audiences want to enjoy the experience in theater and they'll pay for the privilege. In the galleries, I'm just not going to spend much time here, but it was a very cynical approach to it. And, and if you did sell a work, it was gone to you and the public forever. It was taken away from you. Theater, I, I, I was just reveling in this remarkable thing about every night, new eyeballs were in there watching your work. Uh, and really, and you could, you could make a move that, was important and communicative and felt like you were part of something that was very positive. I have a studio filled with 45 people here. Most of them come from the fine arts world because I, once they get a taste of this theater collaborative collaboration and the quality of work we can do in the audience that it reaches, it becomes very intriguing for them. So it's, a, it, it's an interesting thing. I uh, was first accused by my serious fine artist friends of selling out. I'm doing commercial work. I'm doing stuff for Broadway. Um, I embraced it totally. And I've gone totally down that rabbit hole in that uh, half of my studio's work is for themed entertainment and things that are very public. You know, uh, what's wonderful is we have 45 parades and shows through the Disney and Universal theme parks, different theme parks every day. And there's this wonderful sort of feeling I get uh, that I'm, that, that you're always communicating. So my mm -hmm. background, I made the jump to theater arts and never went back. I'm still a fine artist. And, you know, there is a division fine arts, meaning that, you know, you're, you're working for fixed 
usually fixed assets in a, in a, in a, in a gallery situation, a museum, if you're lucky, um, in theater, you know, what we do. So character designer was a, a thing that came in lockstep with film. A lot of fantasy films, uh, required characters that were not human. I have a philosophy. I use the human for everything I can. And I only add additional uh, characters or I only use the uh, non-human solutions when I can't do it any other way. And so as a result of that, I have a, a lot of what we call hybrids and the, probably the best, you'll see it in Beetlejuice. You'll, the best example of that hybrid is the, is the Lion King on Broadway now in its 26th year and the most successful show in history, uh, having eclipsed the budget of the film income by a factor of seven now. Uh, we have nine shows around the world. We use humans to tell animal stories in a way that doesn't subvert the human at all. The, the, our philosophy, my philosophy is uh, the craft of acting is the pinnacle of, of theater. And what we do to support it in stagecraft, set design, lighting is, is all in service to that primary connector, the human. So mm -hmm. the Lion King kind of blew minds because we did a lot of exposed puppetry. We just let the performers, uh, that's where we decided the, the split focus of today's audiences can handle Timon, the actor, manipulating Timon, the puppet, and the audience focusing where exactly we want them to. Uh, at sometimes it's the actor, and sometimes it's the puppet, sometimes it's what Julie Taymor calls the duality of both of those things. But it's a, it's been a philosophy that, throughout my career, and I think it's a way that made my brand of special effects and character design merge very well with traditional Broadway and drama ballet, opera, all the things I, I like to do. I'm a big fan of crossing between disciplines, all within live entertainment. So I really love concert avant-garde dance. We have an even mix at my studio and I, I, I curate projects based on that variety always being present. When you, and those of you that are going to be live performance Actors, I, I recommend you do video and you do film and you do to, you, you really get across, you cross pollinate the, the skill set, especially when you're young to find what really works for you. I have found what works for me is broadness. So mm -hmm. I, uh, and, and, and in, in a lot of cases, I'm still, I, I do things that are not on stage. I'm doing invention. I'm doing practical objects. I work with robotics companies in helping them develop technologies that connect with viewers uh, with few people, there's a beautiful whole new field called HRI, human robot interaction that is coming out. And because we're living in a world with self-driving cars and, and even the theater experience is becoming more technological. So how to, by knowing technology, uh, you, you can embrace it in its pure, you can embrace the, the, the craft of acting and theater in its purest form by knowing those tools and how to use them correctly so they don't get in the way. The Beetlejuice is a show that with a lot of technology, but it wanted to feel very analog, very down and, you know, uh, down and dirty like the movie. So we had, we had a great deal of fun. The, just speaking about the design process uh, of, of a show like Beetlejuice, this was a, a, a predetermined intellectual property, a piece that people already knew, which is, Harder than it seems when mm. you have a beloved piece like that. Um, you've all read a novel and then you heard it was going to be made into a movie and you, with trepidation, you go see the movie because you're so afraid that your, your possession, that the, in, the, the takeaway from that novel will be disrespected or something. So Beetlejuice had r ridiculous amount of people who, who were fans, you know, it's a, it's a cult yeah. movie. Uh, coming to that is is quite different, and and it, it, if if we had done it the year it was re released or the next year, it would be different than you know the gulf that from the, the, this time that it has to gestate and become this sort of cultural icon. So you're it, it, it's actually many shows get slammed because they went too far, they took it too far. So we knew that we had certain uh, landmarks in the Beetlejuice. I mean, they're the shrunken head. We just knew we had to play. It's the simplest thing in the world, but 
But we also knew that it was going to be a showstopper, literally. So there's something like that comes up. So you, the writers and Alex Timbers paced the show with some expectation of, you know, what are the absolute must haves in the show and where can you add license? And you should, you know, you, we are destined to just not make slideshows of movies, but to really right. bring, bring something of our own to it, but carefully taking the, the familiarity that the guest already has with the material along with that innovation with, so with Beetlejuice, we started with, a script that had some, you know, the sandworm and the real, you know, the characters mm -hmm. that you had to have. And then a lot of, a lot of new things. And then we, because it's a comedy and props and visual comedy is so important. It was quite fun to think about how we could really extend the Beetlejuice characters with like random acts of magic, you know? Uh, so there's a lot of little sight gags and it's very densely layered with very simple analog tricks, but then also quite a lot of very sophisticated techniques such as projection mapping to get, mm. to get whole sets to transform. So everybody, like I said earlier, everybody, these, these six or eight disciplines are in lockstep early talking about how they're going to do it but not so, so locked in that you can't make discoveries along the way. One of the, the markers of a very good theatrical production group and creative group is that they can be honest with themselves and see in the moment that you might've charted it out intellectually, but when you start getting in readings and start getting in there, as you've all just realized, things change. And some things that you thought were going to be magnificent don't, but little opportunities appear along the way. And if you're not in the right mindset, if you're not respectful of that process, you'll miss those great opportunities. What happens to me is I, you know, I'm working with a character and they, they do something and I say, Oh, that's don't do that. You're not supposed to do that. And then I say, no, do that again. Now turn that upside down. And it's amazing the the journey, and that's the fun. That's that's one of the most joyous parts of our work is accepting what uh, the sort of great gods of theater give you, <laughs> the, the, mm -hmm. the, the the freebies, uh, and not having your ego in the way that you don't see them see them coming, and we we are in a world where we can propose design and present a show in in real time animation we actually prepare too much because we have the techniques to do that and um we do a lot of previs of shows now and every time you make every time you use these techniques you're getting a chance to look at the show objectively but you're also locking in the show so it's really an interesting thing i i do a lot of speaking about how to use digital how to use referencing and digital technology how how far to research a subject how far to research what others have done with a subject before you yourself actually think about it and this is one of the things that in my design process um and specifically in beetlejuice we, while we were looking at the the film as our as our you know the evergreen document we were really open to new discoveries and we knew that the audiences would appreciate that if they were governed by the principles of the, of, of, you know, Tim Burton's original film. So the design was, I started with the things that were obvious. Uh, now, one of the things that you will see as you're going behind the curtain in these various shows is that the showrooms, theaters, Broadway especially, has very little storage space. They were designed for little vaudeville shows with before the world wanted LED screens and ma massive scenes. Uh, they were just little little wings and a, and, a, and a proscenium stage. So what is quite extraordinary about a show like Beetlejuice is it's like a Swiss watch backstage. And so much of my work and the scale of some of the elements of Beetlejuice were, were uh, compromised by our ability to put something big out there. So there's a lot of, uh, we call them just generally Insta shapes. We do a lot of things that have to, very complicated and the audience never gets to see this complication. It's the way things store. If you go see Beetlejuice, you'll see half of the props and scenery are stored on chain hoist 
up in the grid and the, it's a whole clockwork about how it's so, so it's how it stays. So you can't just do what you want to do. You have to work very closely with the physical limitations of the of the, the stage itself. You have a lot of limitations in theater space being the one of them uh, budgets, audience attention, uh, timelines, you know, it's just so much uh, to to consider. So being a good collaborator, listening to all those different groups, always having uh, frequent updates. I'm a actually the Zoom call actually helps theater because we stay in touch better. We, uh, but it also means that you're never out of touch, and it's uh, it, it can it can take away the some of the time we spend in introspection, really designing, and uh, so it's nothing but advice to you learn how to not over communicate, but find real times, you know, schedule times. I like, we like the weekly or the biweekly update rather than just random calls. Um, so back to Beetlejuice, uh, the, the design process for me begins with, uh, with sketching and not too far down the line. I have a dance studio and part of my company and, and we'll do a paper mock-ups, literally gaff tape and, drawn on foam core and paper, we physically get into it with actors, uh, dancers, or even myself. There's never been a piece that I've designed that I haven't sort of inhabited physically at some point. Um, we, we learn a great deal through the actual workshopping of these things. As good as you are, and I've been at this about 38 years, you can't do it all up here. You have to, the, the heart and the hand and the head, they're all, they're all connected. So workshopping is a big deal. Uh, those of you that are actors, the, the readings, the, the round table readings and the, uh, literally just getting, spending as much time as you can in that character, reading those lines, uh, in the case of a designer, as much time as you can spend with the other designers, uh, lighting, makes everything work sound makes everything present and you can see a show that is distinctly done in compartmentalized ways and you can see a show that everybody the creatives have, have really been locked in it is no accident when you show see a show that's cohesive it doesn't come from you don't phone it in so this is also what makes live theater so interesting as a form as our world gets more technical technologically distant from each other we see audiences today neighbor elbowing their neighbor saying this is really happening and that is like a new special effect this is very important because now immersive entertainment we're all aware of immer the immersive area of Entertainment will be a thing in our future that was a thing because of the isolation of the digital world and the, and the lack of hands-on physical presence um, that those things are now being packaged as entertainment. Real life is being repackaged as entertainment, Real, really using all five sense, senses in an environment. It, and it, it, I'm, this is in no way cynical. I'm just telling you this is a new form of entertainment. 20% of my work now is being asked to work on immersive uh, environments, self-propelled walkthroughs, sleep no more, the, the sort of shows that you're seeing. Um, you know, and then, then there's the good and the bad. There's also, you know, as much as I love Van Gogh, I really don't like Van Gogh projection immersion exhibits uh, because Van Goghs are this big. And they, they're in Amsterdam. They're not mm. on the warehouse wall. So it's funny. But and they also seem very uh, because it's early stages for immersion. It, they'll eventually get much more dramatic uh, and involved and combine theater with the environment. It's it's happening. So it's a, it's I'm just I'm terribly excited by the future of um, but it, it is going to be a category in itself. Uh, that will eventually just merge and become another another thing in the in the quiver that we have in entertainment. Back to Beetlejuice. So the drawings are done. Um, we make presentations uh, to to first the creative group group, and then once that once we're feeling in lockstep, we go to the producers. 
uh, for their valued opinion. They know their product. They know their audience. And then we go to budgeting and scheduling. And then there's a whole dance that you have to play. You've all been involved in budgeting uh, meetings. Uh, when you get when you get pretty secure and advanced in your career, you can demand that the parameters of budget are given to you because <laughs> you actually don't need the practice. You, you, you can actually do very clever, amazing things in a restricted budget, but it's good to know. Uh, so even in Beetlejuice, we, uh, we, we knew sort of the parameters of where we could really plus out the experience and where we'd have to economize. And it's really uh, uh, fun to, to work in, 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 in budget restricted theater, which is most of it. Um, mm -hmm. I also work in theater that there's absolutely no budget. You know, I do a lot of Olympic opening ceremonies where you can't possibly predict a budget and they go impossibly over budget. Uh, but so what we could spend in Sochi, Russia or, or Beijing, China, or any, I've done nine Olympics opening ceremonies as a designer. And, um, that's really blue sky, but it's not, it's not theater and you won't experience it unless you're into these sort of governmental supported programs. So the budget, uh, the, the ideas are first sussed out through the creative group. Everybody feels good about them. We do, we do artwork, present to the producer. We figure out the parameters. There's a bounce back. Oh, go back to the drawing board. We have to find a different way of doing this because there's not storage space. We mm -hmm. can't possibly afford an animatronic. Uh, so then I go back to the drawing board and we figure out um, how we can do it with humans. I already stripped things down to their essentials. The most impact for the story. Uh, I, I, I'm not a big fan of wasting resources and money and time. So we actually, the first thing I go to is often a human manual prop solution to a, to a problem before I go to technology and animatronics. We do plenty of animatronics and we do plenty of things that are computer controlled, but my philosophy, as I said earlier, was embed it within the hands and hearts and, and, and techniques of acting and actors and dancers. All of my puppeteers, and there are thousands of them now, have come from the, the dance world. I don't oh, hire, I don't hire puppeteers. Julie Taymor and I kind of came up together doing that. And w because we started exposing puppeteers. Sure. And, and with Lion King. Yeah. With, with the Lion King and many six shows before yeah. um, where, so they have to look good. It is a craft and, and they dancers can count music. They're disciplined. They're used to working in ensemble or singly uh, as, and they're, they're extraordinarily hungry to make it work. They're about, they're about expressing an idea through their body. And it's much, it's not too far away from puppetry. So yeah. simply it's said, I mean, an idea through your body with an object attached yes. now. And people are surprised. I had much to the uh, chagrin of a lot of puppeteers. Julie and I were, criticized heavily by the puppetry community because we made it a point to, to hire dancers primarily uh, because they also, we have scenes where the dancers are dancing and the puppeteers are specialists. I still use specialty puppeteers generally uh, on things that are physically, I use stuntmen kind of level people to do a lot of my work because it's so extraordinarily difficult both physically in terms of weight, this, this strenuous, generally not for the dexterity that a puppeteer has. We generally don't do puppets that are overly gratuitously complicated uh, because I believe in the human expression and actually don't, uh, I think gratuitous movement doesn't work on a puppet. I, we like general movement. I mean, if you look at the Lion King, we, we experimented with Mufasa and Scar's masks actually moving, blinking eyes, speaking at the same time as the, the performers. Way, way wrong. That avenue turned out to be gratuitous and uh, tricky. And it was so much pure when it all came from the actor. And this was a symbol. But the audience thinks. Many people say, I love the way the eyebrows move on Mufasa and and nothing moves, but it's the, it's the, tra it's the transposition that they make from the actors. So mm -hmm. I know that the use of the, 
the pup, a visible puppeteer uh, is always it, it adds to the context and the intent of the, of, of the scene. So that in Beetlejuice, there's not a great deal of puppetry that's not hidden, but there's lots of those those sight gags. And it's a blend between and much, much of my work is a blend between costuming, uh, props, really scenery and puppetry. I, I'm a I'm a hybrid in the middle. Um, whatever tells the story best. So I've become quite expert in all of those forms. And I do proper, you know, I do production and scenic design and costume design and pure props design and puppetry is generally right there. I, it seems like I can always get puppetry into a show. It's always, always has mm -hmm. a use. Um, one How thing do you that, um, choose ahead. your materials? So you mentioned like budget constraints and these different sight gags, the, the weight, right? So what, capacity people have to carry things. Um, so yeah, depending on the project, how do you, how do you make those decisions? Well, it's a great time to be a, a craftsperson working in these techniques because there are so many modern techniques and materials, the use of carbon fiber, carbon fiber is a very lightweight, uh, woven composite, much like fiberglass you've heard of. And, uh, your tennis racket, or your golf club is, or, fishing pole probably is made of carbon fiber. We were the first to use it in theater in the early eighties. And uh, now it's used quite a lot, but we are the, the reason the Lion King works is that every one of those masks, everything that looks heavy in wood is featherweight carbon fiber disguised to look like wood in, in Beetlejuice, the sandworm, uh, the bigger props are made in carbon fiber. And uh, so today's technology uh, allows me. So I choose materials based on their uh, weight is a huge issue. Durability, you know, at 10 shows a week, uh, durability and the, and the, and the, and the systems, it, people are surprised to see how uh, the industrial design and the quality of engineering plays in, in a prop that would come out of my studio or my designs or many uh, designers today. We uh, things it turns out that things can last a long time and you don't have to have doubles. And uh, and but what gets in the way of performance all the time is weight. You've all you actors have been given a prop. I, how will we, you know, weight is the first mistake people make. And um, so what we want to do is make things effortless. So your performance is not so you don't have to split your mind and think about the technique of of the thing. It is intuitive and natural. So ergonomics, mm -hmm. how it fits the body, uh, literally the fit, weirdly enough, the way it looks to the viewer, the aesthetic is farther down the list of my considerations because I know that's the easy part. You can make sculpture look great, but if it has to move, it, there are 90% of your problems are gonna be in the movement, not in the way the thing looks. So we are, um, look, I'm a designer with a subscription to Plastics Today magazine. So I'm always researching what's next. I'm super thrilled by the high-end sports industry. The just the helmet design for protection has trickled back into theater with all these options we have for connecting to the human body. Uh, the uh, Costuming is a dying trade. It's really sad. Broadway has very few costume shops. It's new people aren't learning this and it's very very interesting to me so we uh, but the apparel industry is going cra crazy there is a really good time to be a costume designer uh, a costume builder there are so many wonderful materials and if you've ever seen a costume designer go through a shop they feel their way through it too so i i'm always feeling like i said we test new materials. When I see a material that I think could be used in theater, I start messing with it. I, I literally, and then I talk to the industrial designers who made it. They say, how are you going to use it? And I say, you don't even want to know. Cause it's, I'm, I'm, I'm not doing it the way you intended. So this is fun because materials give ideas. They, they oh, really do. Yes. Yeah, so if I find a new super lightweight fabric that you can, blow blow in the air with your own breath i use it for a flame effect or you know our transparency um we do so much projection and lighting right now i'm looking for materials that that gather light and mm -hmm. and, and and our shears and there's so many new gauzes and shears that came from the science of 
of uh, the, the chemical industry and how synthetic fabrics are extraordinary now. Um, there's all the rules of flammability. Nothing that you'll ever see coming onto a Broadway stage is flammable, which restricts a great deal of materials. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a factor that people don't appreciate. I see it in amateur theater all the time, things that are done that are quite dangerous um, because they, they, could, they could burn. Um, get me back on track with the questions that you wanted me to answer because no, I mean, this is fantastic. You, you've, you've answered a lot. There's so much, so much here. You have so much wisdom. Um, I think I, you know, was just curious about your design process. So it sounds like you start with a problem, say the problem is we have to turn Beetlejuice the movie into a stage play. And it has these, these, um, fantastical elements right that you want to make live and so then step one you mentioned you you sketch and then you bring that to life with so who who are those people that you're meeting with in the room to begin with is it the designers and then i know you mentioned you meet with producers so is it like the technical director you meet with first are you reading the script first and then meeting with the director how's that work and does it yes. is it different depending on the project oh it's it's the best it's pretty typical um the director is the key, you know, it's the ringmaster. I'm fortunate to be able to, you know, as the puppetry or props or designer, you know, it, I think I introduced the idea that they should be at that table too. So, because it's, if it's going to be a character, it has to have the directorial. And so the, the key people are the director and the writer. Uh, if it's, if it's a mu if, if it's a musical, there's music being developed in lockstep. That's really important to understand that language. And conversely, the writer and the composer are loving to hear about the physical stage that is kind of being conceived because mm -hmm. it's literally the materials, the scale of it, it's lighting, it's qualities start influencing the music. If it's being done in law, it, it's, let's take opera, for instance, the music is a given. The only the reason why opera is so radically avant garde in its visual solutions is because that's the only thing you get. You get musical interpretation from singers, but the only real innovation can come from the scenography, costume design, props design. This is precisely why opera really is a has the more expanded avant-garde notions that it has in terms of visual design. That's why thing is so big and outrageous because you can't, you can interpret music differently, but it is locked. Um, in a new musical, it's quite fun when like Beetlejuice, you had the movie, but we have a new musical being and new, a, a new dramaturgy, new writing. So we all try to stay as in, in close contact as as possible. So when I say six or eight people, sometimes it's four people, sometimes it's 10 people. But um, I, I will sit in on technical meetings that just because they, they start infecting the idea. But usually the technical director of the show is, and the, uh, the, the, the more fundamentals of, of the physical theater are later after the creative team has already have something in motion. Because a great technical director will say, I'll make anything happen. I just have to know what that thing is. Mm -hmm. So you want to get it to a, you want to get it to a point. I'd say many shows get 50 to 75% through their creative process, scripted, storyboarded before you start getting too involved in the, in the, the shops or the technical director. Uh, and that's, that's dependent on the producer. Some some shows I design, I have to do a design package that is put out to bid. That means that five or six shops will look at producing the puppets I design. Mm -hmm. And so what you'll have to do there is a, uh, much of it is done on teleconference where you, all of the competitive shops are on the call and you have to describe what the show is, this, what it is. And everybody then goes away and they spend a week and then they come back with pricing. Wow. Uh, and then one of them is chosen with your involvement. This is very typical. You would say, I like Hudson Scenic for this. Um, well, they were the highest bidder. Well, no wonder. That's why I like them. You know, they're always mm. one. Um, but then you finally 
uh, you limit it down, you choose a shop and then you do it all over again. You go into a very deep dive and then generally they, you have to go visit many times that studio that's building your things. I am an outlier in the world because I have a fabrication company and a designing company. So I learned long ago that some of my most successful and complicated products that I design, I can't, I can't have done by strangers. I have to have it done mm. by my people. And so I, I've had the fortune of having same geniuses for over 20 years. And like I said, I have 45 people and the average person working for me has been here 13 years, but there are no other designers who have their own shops. It just doesn't exist. I don't know why, but take note of this. It's very interesting. I, I have producers tell me all the time, I love working with you because you sit at those meetings, you're with the director, you design it, you, 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 you build it, you come on stage, you, re you rehearse it. And, and, you know, and so it's, it's weird because um, designers lives usually are in hotel rooms somewhere where they're visiting the shops that are building their things. And I find mm -hmm. that a, it's not my favorite lifestyle. I do it a lot, but um, so I'm just telling you the process for Beetlejuice. So we built, we've built all the puppets in the, in the Beetlejuice, uh, in the tour, I've had some outside shops build these, uh, cause of capacity. And so you'll see when you see Beetlejuice, some things that not from my hand, but from my hand. And, uh, so that's what happens. You, you, as a designer, you have to babysit all along the way, including putting the thing on stage. It's usually a, 12 to 18 month process, a typical design evolution. Sometimes it's 24 months when the idea is first seeded, but by the time you really have a team and a theater and a, and a producerial momentum, it's 18 months. That's sort of the magic number, uh, which is goes by in an instant. It's amazing how much you, you are, when you're teching the show, you wish you had more time and you, and when you're early on, you're feeling like, oh, I have plenty of time, but never be over chauvinistic about being too early. Hmm. So I think this is important. So you have 45 people. So could you explain the difference between design and fabrication? Because I think those are two different career tracks, right, that someone could pursue. Yes. Um, they're really important, as I said, to understand both aspects of it. I, all of my builders, I'll call them makers, uh, understand the weird dynamic ethereal world that is a designer. And cause we, we, not only my designs are built here, but really some of the world's greatest and most obtuse designers hire us because we we're good at cracking the nut. You can come in with just very a vaporous idea and many designers don't, I, I'm a drafts person. I, you know, I get down to really detailed drawings, but many people just do a sketch and a description and you have to read between the lines. Uh, and so many designers come to my studio and sit in this very room and we sit around this very table and we figure it out. And then they stay, they, they go away, they go to the hotel and they come back the next day. And I've got a, I've got, an object made in cardboard and tape and a performer in it. And we say, how does this feel? Oh, I, th I, I think it, it needs to be bigger right away. We learn these things. So mm -hmm. uh, they would never known it needed to be bigger unless they stood in the room next to the actor wearing it. So it is a process that, so I'm answering your question. The builders, the makers are responsible to respond to this, uh, artistic process. And, and, but some people will come in with a blueprint of what they want. Others mm. will come in with just an idea. Others won't even have good command of the English language. And we have to find, find a way through it. Um, and then what is a designer? A designer is somebody who conceives the solution, you know, in my case, visually, but then, you know, you have audio designers and, and other things that aren't visual, but it's, uh, those are people that you're looking for innovators who are both can, can reach things, can reach outside the box and, 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 and imagine things that don't yet exist, but have a good command of what already 
is possible and what does exist. I find the best designers have a really good sense of theater history. Mm -hmm. uh, and I find the best designers don't do a lot of research about that history when they're tackling a project. And this is really an important note for you because people, producers and your peers can smell generic work instantly. And if you want to be an A-level, take risks and don't rely on a generic approval. Don't, mm. don't spend zillions of hours looking at YouTube videos of similar dances, operas, or, but do that, but only after you give it, only after you go after it with just body and soul, your own subconscious choices, your early choices in an idea, in idea making. And it might, if it's opera, I'm going to listen to the music, but if you're in my room with me and I'm designing an opera, I'm saying, Emily, what color is that music? And you're going, I don't know. Emily, give me a color. Well, it's blue. And then we do a round table and we take gut instincts. Mm. And guess what? At the end of the day, 18 months later, when you're on stage, you realize that more than half of your good ideas came from those initial golden moments. And back to my point about being an A-level designer versus a B-level designer, people are more expert than you think. And if you're nicking ideas or just even adapting an idea that's already cooked, you're going to be you're going to be, it's going to be known and you're going to just never be at the top of the list. Mm. This is really important. And so young designers and actors and people have a chance to fail and take risks, but the risks are the things that will make you an A-lister. I'm just using that term A-list or B-lister. I don't really like it. I don't know about it, but you know what I mean by that. Mm. Um, so I'm a big fan of, and I also don't let friends copy and be too generic. If I have colleagues that I know are just, they just want to redo the thing that was, that worked in Pippin 20 years ago. I just challenge them on it and say, I think, yeah, that's a solution, but it is a solution that is, that others haven't seen before. So I'm just, I'm just, I, I honor the audience by assuming that they are expert too, but I have noticed this in meetings as people, because I've got to watch a lot of careers develop yeah. and I've taken copious notes on, on who, who get, and, and people say they always get the jobs or what, you know, it's, it's not man, woman, wealthy, I'm, you know, you know, it, it is, it is purely the results that come out of you and your ability to support them and follow it through and accept with humility. Uh, it's, this is not a world for narcissists. Narcissists always do the copies, you know, it's for people with a, with control of their ego that can really, and it, you feel so much better about a show or your work when you know it was original. Hmm. So half of the value of what you're going to be doing in your work is going to be your own personal pride, your own takeaway, your, your, your sense of accomplishment, what you've left behind, what you've left behind, what you've contributed. And when it's pure, you know it, you of all people know it, even if you can fake it and, you know, get around the idea that you're, 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 you're spotted as being, you know, but influence is hugely important. I mean, I, Picasso is my absolute guru. I don't make a painting without thinking about w what he would do here or that. And I, and I have used those influences, but only filtering them through your own gut. So mm -hmm. I, 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 so the shows that we're talking about have uh, the Beatles goose is a, is a copy of a film, but very innovative it has its own spirit. And one couldn't say it's a, just a generic repeat of the movie. So this was on our minds in conversation as we were doing this with everybody. What are we going to bring to it? Some pieces I just wanted just what the film delivered. 
uh, uh, other pieces, you know, we had, we had a chance to invent new, new illusions, new magic, new characters, and we really embraced those, but done in the spirit. How would, how would Tim Burton do this? Yeah. Alex, Alex Timbers is a director who has, has his own creative spirit, but is so locked into the continuation in a case like of, of, of Burton's thinking process. And, uh, and uh, that was the case with the music and, and the, and the story it all feels like Beetlejuice style because mm -hmm. it is. Well, my goodness, I could just talk to you all day, but we are <laughs> quickly approaching an hour and I just want to be, um, you know, conscious of your time. But so thank you so much. This is, you know, my last question is always like, what advice would you give to high school students interested in the field? But you, there's so much good advice sprinkled throughout. Um, I do just want to leave you with if there's anything else, you know, that you feel like we didn't touch on in this conversation that is like your words of wisdom, the things that really drive you that you wanted to leave. Um, with everyone today. Yeah, I guess uh, my last piece is that that risk taking I was telling you about. It's real. So uh, you're young. You can try different things. There's two things I'd like to leave you with. You're going to see a lot of, you know, in my work, it's kind of technical theater, but at the same time, it's high level concept. Uh, learn them both. Pay attention to everything. You may think I'm going to be a singer. I do not need to learn what a stage manager does. You do. So uh, and uh, by you knowing that it's going to grease the wheels of your career, uh, even in an audition, w those little small talk questions are finding out how well-rounded you are as well. Mm. It means a lot. It means a lot. Not, yeah, the voice, but do you see how smart they are? So they're going to be, they both have great voices. Yeah. But this one was like attentive, ask questions, you know, uh, just there's, the personality of your um, your broadness, your your interest in everything really is going. And like I said, people can smell generic. They can smell authenticity of a, of your interest, your real hunger. So I just say, don't come in. You know, everything matters. You know, mm -hmm. you know, you don't know that that sloppy guy in the elevator you came up to the audition with isn't the producer, you know? So, um, just always be on. Uh, and the second thing I would, uh, urge you to do is just take advantage of your youth to try on a lot of different stuff. And this idea of today's young students tend to manicure themselves a little too much, much because there are social media profiles. Mm. When I was 20, I didn't have to do that. So I didn't ever have to lock myself into describing what I was. And so I do, this is a piece of advice. You can take it or leave it. Don't get yourself formed too early uh, because I can guarantee that 80% of you will be doing something different than you expected in 10 years. So this is this idea of keep, it's also a really exciting time because there are so many options, but you're asked to be so put together. I mean, I've, I see 13 year olds with, you know, manicuring their, their, their social network profile. And that's, you don't do that at 13. You, 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 need, you need 13 different profiles. Uh, so I just, I just want you to keep an open mind as you're going through this program of getting behind the scenes. There's a lot behind the scenes. So uh, any, any one of them might be your thing. Like, I feel I, I'm uh, my calling was theater, but I did not know it at your age. Um, I was lucky enough to, but I didn't just get a call out of the blue. I did sculptures in galleries that that look like theatrical objects. And the, and and weirdly enough, they were so well done. The, the people who called me weren't just downtown like schmucks. This was Robert Lepage, Julie Tamar, William Friedkin. I, I, I like to say I started from the top and I'm working myself down, but it was because I took the risk of making these art objects that were recognized as beautiful things that could live on theater. Mm -hmm. And then what they did is they invited me to come into the world that I was supposed to be in. Mm -hmm. And, and I might've bypassed it. I might still be a lonely, alcoholic, overly intellectual painter in a little dark room. And uh, I'm so glad that wasn't my life. <laughs> Thank you very much. Good luck with all the tours. Enjoy Beetlejuice. It's, 
I wish I could see it for the first time again. Uh, yeah, what's so cool is that it had its pre-Broadway premiere at the National, and so now it's coming back. So it'll be interesting to see, too, how design changes. Which we we figured out a lot of trouble in, in D.C. when we were there. That was quite fun. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Take care.